For the credentials of the tangible contract terms, um, and that's the basic topic. If I don't discuss anything else, that is what I'm going to be discussing. Simply because I've been getting a few comments about that, you know, questions about tangibility or non-tangibility, which tells me that, well, it gives me a hint that the people asking the questions are interested in syntax, which is obviously one of the most intriguing things to a correct sentence structure outsider you know how to syntax things putting those numbers above the words seems to be a very mystical process for some people it was for me when i first started i mean wow it's just to try and think back you know and i do i have to do i have to remind myself of this from time to time what it's like to be a beginner, what it's like to have that rush of enthusiasm, learning something new, so crazy, mysterious, like quantum grammar, which I don't use that term quantum grammar very often. I prefer to use the correct name for the technology, correct sentence structure, communication, partially syntax grammar, mostly because I can. Most people can't say that. Not even Russell J. Gould or Mark Lowercase K. Kishon Christopher can say that five times real fast. I think I can, although I've never tried it. Why, why don't I try it right now? Live in front of everybody. I'll try and say correct. I'll, I'll try and say that phrase five times real fast. Correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar. 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 Boom, done. <clears throat> just because it is the correct name. But the enthusiasm one gets, you know, when they first started learning it, like I did, watching, I'm just going to be totally, you know, upfront with, with everyone here. I think, I, I will tell you, and I do, I share this in another video where I talk about how I came to the topic of correct sentence structure, communication, parsley, syntax, grammar. It was 2017, and I was just nearing the end of my study of the trivium method, which took about two years. And I was watching some interesting videos from an individual known as Quasi Luminous. There was a YouTube channel called Quasi Luminous, which I, I don't think it's there anymore. But back then, it had a lot of subscribers. And was getting a lot of uh, attention in the conspiracy domain of, of YouTube, the conspiracy sector. So I was watching Quasi Luminous's channel, and he reposted a Mark Lowercase K. Cachon video. I think it was the four hour video or four or five hour video of Mark talking about the tricks and traps. Very famous video, probably Mark's most famous video. And I was listening to him, and I was really enthralled by his presentation. The way he was speaking, I could tell that he wasn't like a, how can I put this? He wasn't like a natural orator, like David Wynn Miller or Barack Obama or, you know, or Morgan Freeman. He wasn't like a natural orator, but I could tell he had some sort of something because he was getting across his point very efficiently. And so that attracted me to whatever he was doing. I was like, this looks interesting, what he's talking about. 
Where did he get this from? Which led me to Colin David Evan Wayne Colin Miller, which Mark would mispronounce as David Wayne Miller. And he still mispronounces that to this day, as far as I know. Although where he is, I don't where Mark is, I have no idea. Because he got kicked off YouTube. So that's what brought me to it. And I was so excited. My enthusiasm for this grammar was so at such a high level because I had this innate sensation within myself that this was it. This was my thing like that, that I could be good at, that I would have a knack for, that this is what I was looking for. Because at the time I was looking into all this common law stuff, all these laws, rules, regulations, codes, and things like that. And I was so overwhelmed. I remember there is this group on Facebook called Tactical Sovereignty, which was run by uh, a nice guy named Brian Parker. And what really made me sort of veer off from that group was just the general attitude of all the experienced members. They were so condescending to anything that disagreed with their the way that they thought things should be. And, it, and on top of that, there was just so much to stir, study and learn. It was like overwhelming to me. And I was like, man, there's got to be an easier way. There's got to be something simpler out there. And that's exactly what correct sentence structure communication parsley syntax grammar was. Because it is so simple once you learn it. When you first start learning it, it seems so complicated. But I think it only seems that way because it's so different than what you're used to. It's so different, as a matter of fact, that a lot of people from that group, uh, <clears throat> a lot of people from that tactical sovereignty group, it's so different than what they're used to. They just dismissed it out of hand. Not only did they dismiss it, they would attack it. If anyone would bring it up in their group, they would attack it. And even the Brian Parker guy would attack it, which, you know, I don't, I got into it with a couple times with that guy years ago. And, and it wasn't so much arguing about grammar. It was so much pointing out that why, why the hate, why the vitriol, why are you so angry about something you know nothing about? Of course, I couldn't argue grammar back then because I didn't know it. So I wasn't going to put my foot on that field, but I could put the field, my foot on the field of basic etiquette and consideration. And a lot of those common law people, and this is still my experience today, a lot of those common law people just, for some reason, they feel like they're smarter than everyone else. And they try and show it through condescension and through mitigation, which I, I don't really get involved in that anymore. So that, you know, to bring it back to what I first started talking about and the enthusiasm, putting myself in the shoes of a beginner whose enthusiasm for this grammar um, is boundless. I don't want to take that away from anybody, you know, that comes into the comments field and starts asking questions without knowing what they're talking about. On the other hand, I really have to sort of maintain a firm position that I'm not going to spoon feed anyone either. Because once you start spoon feeding, then they become reliant on that spoon. And I've seen that, you know, I've been teaching folks, I've been teaching this for six years, six years, 2018 to 2019, 2020, 21, 22, 23, 24. And I feel that, that this is very important, that people have to develop the capacity to be able to learn a lot of this on their own, to, to take their own initiative in studying this. To, you know, I mean, you, you can watch one video and then all of a sudden you have all these questions. Like someone will watch one video and they'll say, why do you say RE is a particle of negation if it's a prefix? 
And that's probably like the most well-known, one of the most well-known topics in this domain. But they've done zero research, so they start asking rudimentary questions like that. Me, when I do things like this, I will go onto a channel and I will research everything. If I have a question, I will try and search it and find an answer myself. And I will not, you know, reach out to ask a question of the video narrator or host or whomever or teacher. I will not reach out to them unless I cannot find the answer anywhere else or I can't figure it out myself. The cosmos helps those who help themselves. Let's put it that way. So then I got on when, and uh, was decided to take Mark Lore Case Cake is shown to Christopher 12 week course in 2017. I think it was in the autumn of 2017. And I think the course was like three or 400 bucks at the time. I think. Don't quote me on that. Wait, let me think. Oh, no, 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 no. It wasn't. You know what? I'm curious. I'm going to go back and look at my receipt and see and see what it was. So, okay, so what I did was uh, in June of 2017, I contacted Mark asking about the classes. And the webinar series I joined was season two webinar series. And it was week four of 12 when I joined. And it was 25 pounds per class. So there you go. It was 25 pounds per class. Yeah, I guess it was three, four hundred dollars through about you know, three, three hundred and eighty-four dollars. According to my calculations. Uh oh, message retracted. That's never a good sign. So that's what I did. I got involved in his class. It was pretty exciting. A lot of uh, new stuff I was being introduced to. But one thing's for sure. When I came to the... Uh, I think there were one... There was one class, I think the sixth class and the twelfth class had to do with quantum grammar. And I remember looking at those, the things that he was presenting, Mark, that he was presenting. And I had so many questions. I'm like, how, this doesn't make sense to me, what he's doing here. Now, he explained parse very well. But the thing is, is he would use parse and syntax uh, synonymously. And he still does to this day. Like what he teaches as syntax is parse because I've seen no evidence that the guy knows how to syntax to this day. Now, if, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the website You Are Law from an individual named T.J. Mars, I think is their name. T.J. Mars was a student of Mark Sean Christopher. And I don't know what the website looks like today, but I was looking at the website a couple years ago because I had a couple students who were members of the website and they were generous and allowed me to use their username and password to go on to the UR Law website to check out the members section. Lo and behold, they were advertising an advanced syntax class for members only. And guess what? When I clicked on that and I went to it, they had a video talking about exactly the way Mark talks about syntax, only it wasn't syntax, it was parse, meaning they were identifying all of the no contract words in a document, but they weren't 
credentialing adverb, verbs, adjectives, or pronouns. And then guess what? Here's the kicker. They said, for more advanced syntax knowledge, click here. And they gave links to my videos in the paid member section of their website. I don't know if it's that way anymore, but it was back then. And that, that blew me away. I got to say, you know, when I first saw that, I was like, how dare they charge money to send them people to my YouTube channel where it's free. But I got over it pretty quick. So back to Mark. All right. So fortunately, during the, the period that I was taking his course, I met a lot of uh, interesting people, one of whom was Colin Raven, Hyphen Farhad, Hyphen Tohidi, Colin Afrim, which I reached out to because I was reaching out to everyone that had colons and hyphens in their names because I needed someone to teach me the grammar. And I knew at that point very quickly that Mark wasn't the guy to do it. Because how can you teach something that you yourself don't have closure on? It's never going to work. So my first conversations with Raven, I could tell, you know, he was, by my perception, very guarded. But I could tell that he had closure on the grammar and he offered. He said, hey, do you want to learn this? I'll teach it to you. And he told me his background, you know. At the time, in 2017, when I was communicating with Raven, he lived in Hawaii. And also at that time, <clears throat> in the years prior to 2017, he had met with David personally. Colin David Eiffel and Colin Miller, Raven had met with David personally and had worked with him on a few things. <clears throat> And that's all I'll say about that, to respect the confidentiality of that particular biosphere. Um, and I do have a video posted up somewhere on here where you can find the thumbnail where there's a picture of David Wynn Miller and a picture of Raven. And it's an interview that Mark Sean Christopher did with David shortly before David passed away, where Mark mentioned something about a certain topic and then uh david says david's like oh oh you mean raven to show that yes he he knew my tutor that's a continuance of the evidence right there so <clears throat> that got me into learning the grammar and again it was very exciting for me and i will tell you it was very challenging for me that there were multiple scenarios when I got very frustrated, very angry, and almost quit and just gave up because of how much sense it was not making. So if that's happening to you, if anything I say to you causes that type of uh, response within you, I highly recommend you don't give up. I highly recommend you let that feeling pass with all humility and continue on learning because it's part of the process. It's part of the process. So the way that I teach syntax does not rely on any assumption presumption at all. None. It can be learned by rote. It can be learned by repetition. It can be done via process of elimination, if you know the mechanics. And the first most important mechanic to learn is to credential a word as tangible contract or no tangible contract. And in the context of syntaxing, the way we do that is to get it out of etymology dictionary, look up the word, look up the earliest nativity root meaning of that word. And if that earliest nativity root 
earliest known meaning of that word is tangible contract, then you would syntax the word as tangible contract. And when you do that, if you credential the word as tangible contract, it means it will either be a verb, adjective, or a pronoun. It will never be an adverb. Now, if you look up a word and all the red flags of non-tangibility are there, and the earliest nativity root meaning of that word is non-tangible, meaning you don't have a tangible contract with it, meaning it's not based on a fact, then you would credential the word as non-tangible contract, and you would syntax it as either an adverb, verb, or a pronoun. A non-tangible contract word would never be an adjective. Right there, boom, process of elimination. So if you have the last word in a word group or a sentence, is non-tangible, then you know it's either going to be a verb or a pronoun. It's not going to be an adverb because it comes at the end of a sentence. Only verbs or pronouns would come at the end of a sentence. Adverbs and adjectives would not come at the end of the sentence because they're modifiers and there's nothing left to modify. That's why you would never see a standalone adjective or a standalone adverb. That's why uh, these, the individuals from the Syntax Learning Center will teach you that, oh, the word the, T-H-E, it's an adverb. It's always going to be an adverb. So when you syntax a document, you can go in and put number one above all the thes so wrong and it's so cringe to see that to see them teaching that folks let me disprove that right now if you have a sentence the the period you have the and then the period how would you syntax that what's the syntaxing of that it would not be a one one i can tell you that or even the 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 how would you syntax that? It's not going to be a one, one, one. If you have just one single the on a piece of paper, the word the, it's not going to be an, an adverb because there's nothing to modify. What is the adverb modifying the entire sea of space of that document? I don't think so. Words modify words. So that's just one example of why what they teach is so incorrect the word the standing by itself on a piece of paper is what it's a pronoun if you have the word the followed by the word the in a period the the period like the band the band the the that's an adverb dangling participle verb that's a one two if you have the 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 period if you have three does in a row that's going to be a pronoun adverb verb and again, it goes into your five syntax patterns. Do you know the five syntax patterns off the top of your head? That's something you definitely need to know when you syntax. I will bet you dollars to donuts, not one single teacher from the Syntax Learning Center can name the five syntax scenarios off the top of their head. I bet they can't do it. I'll bet you any money they can't do it. So what are the five syntax patterns off the top of your head? If no one did the uh, syntax, answer to syntax and questions, I don't expect them to answer that question either. So I'll just give the answer. I'll give you the spoon, right? So you have adverb, verb, pronoun, adverb, verb, adjective, pronoun, adverb, adjective, pronoun, pronoun, adverb, adjective, pronoun. There's your five syntax scenarios. And no, I don't have, you know, that, that was like the most famous, the most common answer I would get from someone if I was doing a consultation with them. And I'll ask people, I'll say, where do you think your correct knowledge level is? 
percentage wise from zero percent to a hundred percent and a lot of them will say well i think i'm about 75 percent okay what are the five syntax scenarios or or i would say please syntax this sentence and i'd throw a sentence at him and then they'd be like hold, hold on a minute i gotta look at my paper i can't do it without my paper bro if you're in a situation under duress and you're being asked questions and you have a fictitious conveyance of grammar in front of you, you you're not going to really be able to say, hold on a minute. I got to get my, I got to get my cheat sheet. I got to get my paper. Hold on. I got to get, I got to get my list of adverbs from the chief. You're not going to have that. You have to have it here. It's like if you're, and again, I use the analogy of martial arts. If you're being physically assaulted in a parking lot, the skill to defend yourself is not going to magically appear out of, out of nowhere. It's just not. The only chance you have at defending yourself in a parking lot if you're being assaulted is to have training under your belt. Going into a gym or whatever, and physically trading with people, physically getting your ass beat every day so that you know what it feels like and you're developing motor reflexes. Repetition is the mother of technique, as my boxing, boxing coach used to say. So you have that muscle memory and you can you can use those things. You know, if someone's attacking you, you can boom, just, just left hook and they're out or whatever it is you want to use. You got to have these things at your beck and call. If someone's asking you questions about correct sentence structure, you have to be able to answer them like that. You have to be able to syntax it. You have to be able to explain your position and hold that position if you truly hope to be successful. Like that video I posted of um, the gentleman. What is his name? I want to say his name is Mitchell, Mitchell something, where he got pulled over for a traffic stop, and he's holding his Russell J. Gould copyrighted live life claim, holding it up to the cop, saying, this was done by the, the chief judge of the Supreme Court, and blah, 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 blah. Guess what? He ended up in jail that night, because that's not going to help you. In that situation using the logical fallacy of an appeal to an authority the only authority that's going to give you any chance of success of appealing to is yourself you having the knowledge here ready to go that's the reason i came up with an idea to make a very controlled limit trust well, Michael Scott Baxi, you would first have to have closure on correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, if you were going to make a trust, create a trust. And I have written correct sentence structure trusts in the past. <clears throat> so I'm very familiar with those mechanics. But the grammar comes first. Michael, what would you put your percentage of correct sentence structure knowledge on a scale of zero to a hundred. What do you think your closure is there? And if you decide to answer that, then I in turn will pose a test to you. Well, the test is already there. Go ahead and syntax the, 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 thusly. Or if you want, Michael, how about just Share a correct sentence structure where you make the statement of your correct name. In other words, you're telling us what your correct name is, but put that in a correct sentence structure. And I don't mean just write out your punctuated name. I mean, create a sentence with a verb in it, telling us what your correct name is. If you can do that, like, like let, me, let me put it in the chat, room, for example, here. Uh, so you see I'm putting in the chat a fiction babble sentence as a knowledge cultivation tool from your point of view. It says, my correct name is colon Michael hyphen Scott colon Maxi. Now I would like you to translate that into a correct sentence structure claim with a verb in it and everything. 
And if you can do that, I will be able to tell you what your percentage of correct sentence structure knowledge is approximately. Ooh, we got 11 viewers. That's awesome. Unfortunately, I am almost out of coffee. So your sentence is, for the name of this creator with the name of the Michael. Where's your verb? I don't see a verb in there. Number one, well, let, let's just, I'll just stop there. There's no verb in it, so it is not a correct sentence structure. Sentence it is completely adverb, verb, adjective, pronoun. It's basically pronoun, adverb, verb, pronoun, adverb, verb, pronoun, adverb, verb, pronoun, adverb, verb. Pascal, uh, you were correct on your first syntaxing. Did you did you try and syntax the second sentence that I posted? It was uh, where is it? Thusly, he, the the, the 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 thusly. Try syntax that sentence. So, Michael, although you have not shared any syntax at all with us from your correct sentence structure, I would have to say at a cursory glance, you're probably around 25%, 25 to 30% knowledge level of correct sentence structure based upon what you've written here. Pascal has an answer. And that is correct. And I will post the full correct sentence, which is how I would actually prefer you to post it. You know, copy and paste the sentence and then put the number values next to the sentence so we can see exactly what it is you did. Because I'm sure most people are going to look at 4121212212 and be like, what the hell is that? Right? But I get your point, Pascal, and two thumbs up. Awesome syntaxing skills. And for those of you out there watching, Pascal is one of my most advanced students because he knows that every single word in that sentence, thusly, he, the, 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 thusly, they're all non-tangible contract. So you're not going to see an adjective in there anywhere. It's just a matter of knowing what the syntax patterns are. And there are two syntax patterns in that sentence. There's a 412 and the rest of them are 1212. <clears throat> So Michael Scott Maxey has not gotten back to us. So I'm going to do that fellow a solid, and I'm going to write out a sentence using my correct name to uh, illustrate what I wanted him to translate. So this is a correct sentence. And here you go, Michael. This is how you would translate that sentence. My correct name is colon Jason hyphen Matthew colon glass, period. This is how 
one way it would be translated into correct sentence structure. For this claim of the correct name is with the Jason hyphen Matthew of the glass with the authorization of the claimant with the Jason hyphen Matthew by the glass. Asservation. Yeah, I don't know where you're going with that. I may have been too hasty to give you 25 to 30 percent knowledge level of correct sentence structure, because there is that there is definitely nothing in that sentence that you shared there, or in that comment that you shared there, that has anything to do with correct sentence structure. Explain. There's really nothing to explain. It's all it's all adverb, verb, adjective, pronoun. I can't even syntax it because YouTube won't allow. Uh, I'll just syntax like the first bit of your sentence there, because YouTube has a character limitation. So I will syntax the first few words of it. I've never seen this word before, asservation. A declaration that is made emphatically as if no supporting evidence were necessary. That's an interesting word there in and of itself, asservation, not only because of the first three letters of the word, but also because it's a vowel in front of a consonant and it means no. Show me how to look at it. Well, Michael Scott Maxey, that's that's a quite a request there. Um, if you've watched any of my videos, I don't know if you're new here or not, but there are over 900 videos, well, around 900 videos here on this very channel to answer your own question, show me how to look at it. I mean, I'm not going to tell you how to look at it, but if you want to look at it through the lens of correct sentence structure, communication, parsi, syntax, grammar, you're more than welcome to study this YouTube channel and the 900-ish videos here, which share my full closure on correct on that technology. Now, if you're really super serious about it, the best way to get closure is to contact me at jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com and apply for a workshop. I've been teaching this since February of 2018. I provide one-hour workshops where you can come in, sit down just like in a classroom, it's you and I, there is no one else, just you and I. And for 60 minutes, I will teach you correct sentence structure from pillar to post. But you have to contact me at jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com to ask any further questions about that. All right. So I've given you the venue. If you want to apply for a workshop, if you're serious, jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com. So, well, that's good. That's good. So what have you learned here? 
You haven't done any syntaxing at all, and you haven't provided any correct sentence structure. So given what I've already taught you here, if you learn fast, what have you learned thus far? So asservation is a tangible contract adjective, which is modifying non-tangible contract of into a pronoun. And we know nothing can follow a pronoun except for a break in the continuance of the evidence, or as in this case, an adverb. So the is an adverb, modifying truth into a verb, and is a non-tangible contract conjunction. And a conjunction holds a neutral position. It has a neutral condition of state. It does not modify anything, nor is it modified anything. And then it's followed by the tangible contract word claim, which is a verb. Both truth and claim are being modified by the word the. The conjunction and just allows the modification to cross that bridge for the word claim. Now, if this were just a standalone sentence, claim would be a dangling participle verb. But it's part of a bigger sentence, so I didn't put that in there. So, yeah, you want to learn it? Like I said in the, what, what did I say in that one post? I posted up in my uh, community section. I said, if you really want to learn correct sentence structure, you will find a way to do it. You will do what it takes. If you don't really want to learn correct sentence structure, you will find every excuse not to invest in classes or study. It's up to you. No one will do it for you, nor will it just magically appear like a gift from the cosmos. You have to invest energy in order to get a return. Otherwise, you'll be asking the same questions this time next year and the year after. And that's pretty much how it is, folks. You have to put something in to get something out. And the value of what you put in will then determine the value of what you get out. Michael, are you new here? Out of the 900-ish videos on this channel, how many of you watched and studied? Just curious, curiosity. Because I'd have to say probably not very many. Learning this stuff takes a consistent repetition every day of studying. And I don't mean just mindlessly listening to something. I mean actually thinking about what it is you're watching. Going in depth. And the only thing that's going to bring that to you is now space. I mean, you just have to invest now space in it to even begin to build a foundation. Now, I do teach everyone from beginner to intermediate to advanced, wherever you are on the geometric level playing field of knowledge cultivation, I will meet you there and take you where you want to go. Now, Michael, you do have a base. Like, you do have a... You do have the beginnings of a foundation. So it's critical for you, well, for anyone, really, to get a correct foundation to get a foundation that you can certify, to get a foundation that you're confident in. And by certifying the confident in, I mean, you don't say something like, well, 
if someone asks you, why do you, Michael, why do you do it this way? And then you say, well, because Jason said so in this video, that's not closure. That's not a reason to do anything. Or because Russell said so, or David Wynn Miller said so, or whomever said so. It actually, to be 100% forward and blunt with you, it has to be because you said so. And you can provide a continuance of the evidence as to why you're saying what you're saying. You have to know this grammar well enough to do what I'm doing right now. Teach it to complete strangers. Not only that, but teach it to complete strangers under duress in a highly charged, highly volatile situation. Because if you can't, if you can't do it here in this peaceful and neutral environment, like if you feel pressed or if you feel nervous or pressure here, there's no way you're ready to, to use it out there. And again, you know, the people, the, I would say the majority of people that contact me or come into the comments field and they say, yeah, Jason, I'm going to contact you soon to do workshops. Nine out of 10 of them never do. So I hope you're serious about it, Michael, because we need more people. Well, not we need. How can I say that? I think it would benefit the whole biosphere if more people would actually be serious and learn this and not just give lip service. As of right now, I have about 12 students who are advanced enough to be able to walk into any vessel, any venue, any port, any terminal, or foreign vessel and dry dock and be able to hold a position there and walk out safely. 12, from six years of teaching this. And that has to do with them, meaning it has nothing to do with the technology. I'm not nothing to do with the technology. The technology is a small part of it. It's their psychology that is the most important part. Now, there's a couple in there that, that their confidence level is, is not quite what it could be. Because um, some people are more timid than others. However, with this, this technology and being in this type of domain, one may be timid, but when one can also cultivate confidence and aggressiveness and be firm and once you cultivate that willpower then it doesn't matter if you're timid or not because you can transform that timidity into humility and as long as you remain humble as long as you go into those situations truly with the position of peace and neutrality meaning you don't want to hurt anyone you just want to navigate safely and hold a position then the, su the success will just appear, basically. All right. So I got a few appointments coming up here. Michael Scott. I've already given you the venue with which you can contact me. JasonMatthewG17 at gmail.com. If you contact me there in the confidential, I will set up a 10 to 15 minute video consultation um, where you and I can look at each other basically face to face, eye to eye. You can ask me whatever you want. And we'll see if this is indeed something you, you're serious about. Other than that, if you want me to teach you outside of that, you're welcome to study the 900 or so videos here. So there you go. Also, um, I was just reading a comment from another video where a member for the claimant was talking about 
the 78 keys that I mentioned in my last uh, comments video. And people may have a, a few questions about what that means. If you remember, uh, Colin David Ivoin, Colin Miller used to make the claim that he was a key master, a master of the keys. And what was he talking about there? One way to figure out what he was talking about is to look at a basic tarot deck. Like, what is your most basic would be this, right? AW78. There's 78 cards in here. 78 keys. Half positive, half negative. I have been studying that symbolism in tarot since 2015. And so, while I'm not going to claim to be a key master, I claim to be a key steward because I am very familiar with those 78 keys, their alleged meanings, how they're used, and so on and so forth. So that's what he means when he says he's a key master. It just means that he possesses closure and knowledge of the 78 keys. Now, there's no way we can really certify that with him because he's no longer with us. But he did claim to be a 92nd degree Freemason. And his claim to fame through that was uh, the reason why Cohen David Eichelin Cohen Miller, which this is the reason that he gave. The reason why he claimed to be a 92nd degree Mason is because he claimed to have syntaxed this book. by Manly P. Hall. He said he syntaxed this and he rewrote it in correct grammar, allegedly. And that's why he claimed the position of 92nd degree Mason. So I would say, as a guess, that if he syntaxed that book and he rewrote it in correct sentence structure, then yes, I'm sure he's familiar with what the 78 keys are and what they mean, because it's all in that book, if you know how to read it. So... I don't really go into too much on that stuff just because this is a grammar channel. It's not an esoteric occult alchemy channel. It's a correct grammar channel. But I do know that people are interested in those types of things. And those types of things can help after you've gotten closure on the grammar and you're looking for a continuance of the evidence as to why things are the way they are in society and the way the governments do things and the legal system does things. You want to get more closures on those types of things of how religions navigate, um, so on and so forth. That knowledge, the knowledge of the 78 keys can help. And definitely that book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, will definitely help you. Because then you'll start seeing how symbolism is actually used every day in mass media and everywhere else. Michael Scott says, verb, red, noun, or clue. I have no idea what you mean there, Michael. Because none of those things, there is no such thing as a noun. A noun is a no-no. N-O means no, U-N means no. 
you can see behind me right here the 10 parts of speech. You have a conjunction, adverb, verb, adjective, pronoun, position, lodial, fact, past tense, future tense. Those are the 10 parts of speech. There is no noun. All right, no questions. I'm out. Thank you very much. If you would like to learn correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, I offer several choices. The first one, and the easiest one, is to study the almost 900 free public videos on this YouTube channel that you're watching right now. The second option, if you want to see new content, is to click the join button on my main YouTube page or under any video that you're watching. Click the join button and you will see two tiers of membership. If you choose the second tier, the loyalist contributor tier, and you join that for a monthly support donation, you'll get new content, fresh content, exclusive content not available to the public every month. But keep in mind, there's already almost 900 videos here free to the public to study. And the third option is to contact me at the email address at the bottom of your screen. And this is for the serious students only. And apply for a correct grammar workshop. But please include your correct name when contacting me. And I'll set up a 10 to 15 minute video consultation. And you and I will have a conversation. You can ask me whatever you want. I'll answer your questions. I'll do the same with you. I'll ask you questions. And we'll see if indeed you are really serious or not. Thank you.